guys. So I was looking through all of my documents from the way back when, and I found my notes that I used for my master's oral defense. So your bachelor's is typically four or five years, four to six years really, of college that all the big kids talk about. After you graduate from the bachelor's, you have the option to do a master's in something, one, if you can get in, and two, if it's beneficial for your career, and of course three, if you can afford it. I studied at the San Francisco State University. The professors there are wonderful. My flute professor there was Linda Lucas, who is the second flutist of the San Francisco Symphony. Absolutely amazing. Usually a master's is four semesters, two semesters per year. Therefore, it's usually a two-year program. Me and one other person in my year did it in three semesters. We did this because maybe one is that we're Asian, Two is because we wanted to save money, again, Asian. Because the way that you pay for your degree at San Francisco State, even if you only take one or two courses in a semester, there's still sort of like a baseline of tuition that you need to pay. So you save a lot more money if you can finish your classes sooner. I'm just sort of setting the context here for you guys for this oral defense. The oral defense happens in the third semester and whether you pass it or not dictates whether you graduate that semester. The weird part was that because in the oral defense, you are talking to your panel of professors, it doesn't involve any playing your instrument. And you have to do the oral defense even as a performance major, which is what I was. For my friend, I think she was doing more of like a music education master's degree. So her oral defense made a lot of sense because it was actually based on her thesis. Defending her thesis, hence it's called oral defense. Oral just means that it comes out of your mouth, like oral B. But for me, I was a performance major. My thesis was my graduation recital. And the way that the oral defense worked for a performance major was that you could choose one piece to analyze to death and then you present it and then answer questions from your panel. Then they give you a piece 48 hours before your oral defense. And you have to spend those two days analyzing the crap out of that piece, then presenting it and answering questions as they come during the oral defense. So you are literally defending your take and your theories on the music that you are presenting. The huge problem here is that there is no actual real guideline for what exactly you're supposed to present. So I just drew from my experience in classes and I decided to make it almost like a history presentation. In a music history presentation, you have to not only present the historical context for the piece that you are presenting, you also have to look into the theoretical parts of the piece. So you do actually have to analyze it with like Roman numeral analysis and stuff like that to see what the patterns are. And then you can draw more conclusions about like what were some influences during that time that influenced the way this was written did this influence other things you got to think about the composer's life and how his life might have affected the piece that he composed basically you're just kind of like looking around to see how this piece was made and how this piece came about. If you think about it, when you're in a good music history lecture, your professor will field questions while he or she is presenting the material to you. And that is exactly what happens in an oral defense. It's just the professors are asking you all the questions. As you can imagine, last week I talked about the time that I just made crap up and people were like, yeah, you did it. I really connected with what you were performing. You can't do that for an oral defense because when they ask you a question, you either know it or you don't. And there have been several, several cases of people failing their oral defense and therefore having to postpone their graduation pretty much indefinitely until they can pass the oral defense because they did not know the answers to the questions that the professors were asking them. And these professors do not ask crazy, crazy questions. As long as you know your material, forwards and backwards and sideways and upside down, you should be able to answer their questions. So what I did was I took my favorite piece from my graduation recital, which is the Bach 
sonata in B minor for the flute. I'm nerding out right now. I just wanted to kind of show you guys some of my crazy analysis on this. There you go. So now you can see how this looks and every page looks like this. Yep. That is my handwriting from a couple years ago. I think alone on this sonata, I spent three weeks pretty much holed up in my room whenever I was not at school. Here are my notes. I've actually forgotten a lot of this stuff that's on here. Wow, I'm like learning from my own oral defense right now. I'll just read some of this out to you. So my first point was we're not sure who this sonata is for. So I named some random people that historians think this might have been written for. This was such an interesting piece and it's extremely long. Most likely for a person who's really into flute or really like gung-ho virtuoso. And then I talked about the flute and development. So what did the flute actually look like during this time when this was written? This was not written for the metal flute that the poros are playing. It may even have been written for a flute called the flute d'amour, which is like an alto flute. So if you listen to the piece, it makes sense to have a very warm, low sound. Then I looked at the cantatas that Bach wrote in Leipzig during the time that he wrote this piece. And I ended up photocopying some of his arias. And I presented this to my panel as well. And I showed that there's a lot of similarities between how he wrote his arias and how he wrote his sonata and so you could almost say that the sonata was like a giant aria for the flute oh i wrote here that this is a continuo sonata oh that's really interesting because if you look at the harpsichord part it is just as complex as the flute part which is fantastic i think that's part of the reason why i liked it so much oh and then i talked about some weird chord things that he does he goes outside of the baroque field of six or not let's see he flirts with the relative major the conclusion that i drew was that bach was being experimental the intensity in the piece is achieved by keeping a large part of the sonata in a minor key that was basically my spiel on that and what the professors did was exactly what i had predicted every now and then while i'm talking they'll be like oh hey can you clarify this oh, do you know the term for that specific pattern that you see? Apparently the one that they were looking for was ostinato or pedal point. I think pedal point was what they were looking for. It wasn't actually that scary because I actually knew what I was talking about. This was the only time in my life that I never made anything up when it came to music. Everything else there is like some degree of bullcrap in there. Moving on, the piece that they gave me to study for 48 hours coincidentally is by Elliot Carter. For those of you who are big woodwind quintet fans, you will know this name. Oh, I love his woodwind quintet. It's so interesting, it's so weird. As you can tell, I like really old stuff or really weird new stuff. The chair of my panel gave me this piece, which is called Scrivo in Vento for flutes alone, no accompaniment. This was first performed by Robert Aitken. The little preface to the piece includes a poem. So I knew I had to look into this poem. I have completely forgotten about this poem. Let me zoom in for you guys so you guys can see what I did to this preface. Really used my English literature skills to the max here. Analyzed it to freaking death. And then the piece, I did something very similar to the Bach Sonata. So I will show this to you guys too. Wrote all over it. I honestly don't even remember these notes now. It's been quite some time now. It's been quite a few years. It's kind of strange to see my handwriting just like all over this, like being super legit and stuff. But you know, like I said, this was the like most legit music thing I've ever done. I, of course, had to draw the comparison with the Woodwind Quintet. So I did photocopy out a little portion of the Woodwind Quintet. This actually has my markings on it from when I played it with my Wind Quintet back in my bachelor's. It was really awesome to be able to draw like a personal connection to the piece that they gave me. That just so happened. They had no idea that I actually played an Elliot Carter piece before. Typically they try to give you something pretty obscure because they really want to test to see what your research skills are like. Do you actually know what you're talking about? Do you know where to look, etc., etc. So let's see what I said here. Fun fact, Robert Aiken's wife accidentally found out that they were premiering Scrivo Invento, which is this piece, on Petrarch's 
687th birthday. Petrarch is the person who wrote the sonnet. Very interesting. So I talk about high registers versus low registers. I talk about tetrachords. <laughs> For those of you who are super nerds and know what they are, I talked about tetrachords. Talked about transpositions of these chords, inversions of the chords, composite of the chords. So very modern music theory type stuff. I was really, really blessed that my previous school, which was the University of British Columbia, is really into modern music theory. So I learned a lot of that actually from my bachelor's and I was able to apply it here in my master's oral defense. Actually I put here that the woodwind quintet is the first piece he actually wrote with flute in it. You can kind of see where he's developed out of it with this Scrivo Invento. Carter mentioned that he loved the exact idea of box works a simple idea flows into a whole piece. Carter thus was simply thinking in a different slash alternative tonal universe. So he didn't have to think too hard to write everything that way. Bach did the same thing. Oh, I still think that is the most legit thing I've ever done in my musical career. They asked me to stand outside while they deliberated. I believe my oral defense was about an hour, something like that. I think it was like half an hour for one piece and half an hour for the other piece. And within, I would say two minutes, they came out and said, congratulations, you have definitely passed your oral defense. And oh, I cannot tell you how legitimized I felt as a musician. And I just find it really ironic that I felt the most like a musician, not when I was performing the piece, but when I was presenting my findings on pieces. I guess basically from this, I just want to encourage you guys to look more into the pieces that you play, especially if you're dealing with the feeling that you have no idea what you're doing and you have no idea what you're playing or and how to play it. Do research. The internet is a very big place where you can find lots of information and Wikipedia is actually pretty okay place to look for information now. When you know the context of the piece that you're playing and when you know what did your musical instrument look like during the time, was it even written for your instrument? Who was it written for? If you look more into this kind of stuff, you'll really get a much better sense of what you're doing and you won't feel like you have to always make crap up. So there you go. I hope you guys enjoyed me sharing my oral defense experience. Let me know if any of you watching this have been master students or currently are master students. Are you preparing for your oral defense? Have you done an oral defense? Put it in the comments below. I'm sure a lot of people would love to hear your stories too. So anyway, that wraps it up for today. I hope you guys liked this video. And if you did, make sure you give me a big thumbs up and hit subscribe for new videos every Saturday. My last video is over there. And if you want to catch me during the week, my social media networks are down there. But otherwise, Otherwise, I will see you guys next week. Bye. All right, focus on me. Focus on me. Focus on me. Yes, focus on me. Okay. All right. Oh, where are my notes? Oh, I left them upstairs. <laughs>